nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, members of the committee, uh, please take a look at the agenda and see if you need to uh, add or delete anything as presented. Hearing none, I will move that uh, we uh, entertain a motion. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. And the motion is to accept the agenda as presented. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All in favor say no. Thank you very much. Um, approval of minutes for the March 14th meeting. They are attached. Please take a minute to look over those. last year with a target to get to a hundred billion dollars in the next few years as an agricultural industry across the state and Brunswick County has a small portion of that and let's talk about some of those opportunities right here in Leland's as the this part of Brunswick County and the, the Cape Fear region. We'll chat about our situation as I see it some resources that come into play and opportunities that that I'm dreaming of and that you can bounce some ideas off of with me to help our economy grow and develop along those lines. That's how I feel. Here's the basics for Brunswick County. North Carolina agricultural statistics that there is an office in Raleigh just to statistify agriculture in our state. And Brunswick County has some of those numbers. So out of a half a million acres in the whole county, we have 45,000 acres as farmland. And so that's, and 30,000 of those are in the voluntary agricultural districts within the county. You may have seen the little signs that say, I'm a VAD member, voluntary agricultural district member, do a little bucolic scene with the dairy silo because that's this clip art that came from the state even though we don't have any dairies anymore there's a few road names that have dairy in them but that's the only surviving remnant of any sort of dairy industry here although there's a couple of goats that people milk from time to time the average age of farmers is somewhat of a concern that keeps going up and up and up it used to be in the mid 50s now and then 56 it was holding strong 58.9 as of the, the last census of agriculture. Now the new data that's gonna come out 
hopefully in a couple of months. Every five years, there's an agricultural census. Every 10 years, there's a general census. I don't expect that to go down yet. So, and that's, that's general generalization of the agricultural situation in our, our county and in our state. Although we do have a few new farmers coming along, it's primarily operated by the, the father or even grandfather. That's the primary operator, decision maker, and so forth, except in some cases as things are changing over, a changing of the guard, if you will. I'm hearing more and more folks talk about how they're, they're giving more decision power to their the next generation, their son or their daughter, in the operation. The way to, to look at this is basically corn for grain, corn and soybeans and wheat, other grains, there's our wheat down here, are the, the primary money makers for agriculture in Brunswick County. The dots and the asterisks here show that oh, there's not enough people to report this. The statisticians say, oh, you might be able to figure out somebody's financial situation if we report some of that. And that would certainly be the case for cotton, because we have one cotton producer left in the county, two tobacco farmers left, and whereas there used to be 50, 60, maybe even 80 tobacco farmers. Everybody used to have a little bit of that, but that has certainly changed. The tobacco buyout ended two years ago the government payments to tobacco farmers regarding the transition they had to make away from tobacco finished up and that was a, a solid payment to the county that was three quarters of a million dollars between all those farmers and that that faucet dried up recently is that where they, they were paid not to grow they were paid to well hey you used to grow tobacco now you can't the whole industry has changed and now it's a it's allotments and it's contracts. So to help you get into a different kind of agriculture, here's what you part of what you would have been paid for growing tobacco. Sorry, stop growing it. So yes, but I would word it slightly different <laughs> because of uh, the the implications of we're paying you not to grow a crop, even though that's not my people at all. That's the farm service agency that handles all that stuff. So. Sweet potatoes grow all around us. We have a little bit of production here in the county, but it's much larger of a scale around our area. Pender, Columbus, even getting up into the, the middle part of the eastern chunk of our state. So we'll talk about sweet potatoes shortly. Oh, livestock. You'll see a few beef cows as you're driving around. Very rarely will you see a sheep or a goat though there are some, just not enough to, to be a big chunk of agriculture here. Most of our cows go to feeding operations elsewhere to grow out before they're processed. And so we have cows and their calves. The calves grow up, send them off. It's you've heard of pasture raised beef, grass fed beef, and things like that. That's not big here on account of we don't have a whole lot of green grass. The Bermuda grass does very well, but to, to finish off those cows, they need a, a much higher nutrient rich situation, which is easier in other parts of the state. It, it can be done here, it's just not as marbled and tender as our slightly rougher climate. So the people are tough and so are our cows. <laughs> Total, we're looking at $48 million in the agriculture industry right here in Brunswick County as a whole. Neighboring New Hanover, just across the river, their agriculture industry is much more based on the green industry. So nurseries and floriculture, a little bit of traditional agriculture up in Castle Haines and those fringes of the, the big city of Wilmington. More of our situation. Oh, any questions on the, the numbers there? There weren't a whole lot because of uh, the privacy for so can, can, can we get that from the website? Oh, yes. I'm so glad you asked. I meant to put a little 
note down at there at the bottom. Just go to the Department of Agriculture, that's ncagr.gov. NC for North Carolina, AGR for agriculture, ncagr.gov. And look for agricultural statistics. This is the county data. It'll go alphabetically. You can also come to my office in Bolivia. I have this in a book. I keep it out in the office. There's an office copy. Sometimes they walk away. I might have to like drill a hole and climb that sucker down. But I'll, I'll always keep a copy in my office just for you. You just let me let the office know that you're with the Economic Development Commission in Leland, and they'll get you right back. That happens to everybody. It's not just you. But I'll make you feel special. <laughs> Forest swamps and rivers predominate our landscape. So if there's something you can figure out to do with trees or with swamps, other than drain it anymore, and the rivers, it will be well off. I was finishing up my doctoral dissertation recently, and I was in one of our lovely county libraries, and it was, I needed a study break. So I looked over to the World War II section. Lo and behold, there's a whole thing about the river and how our port was used for shipbuilding. That was pretty neat. The whole book, not just the, the two little signs you see over at the, the river park at the municipality that will not be named. <laughs> right, Bismarck like that. Right. So, but that, that ecology predominates our landscape. We drained a lot of that to put in pine trees instead of hardwoods. So although pine trees have always been part of it. Naval stores were huge for this area. Going back to tar pitch and turpentine, you won't get great revenues out of that, but it, it's neat to see. So if there's some sort of historical thing you can do for that, that would be neat. So Never the tar heels about that. Right? See? And I won't say any more about it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for your loss. <laughs> We need loss. <laughs> Sorry for your loss. That's right. Yeah. Well, I, I feel you. Okay, so <laughs> there's a lot of forest products coming through the county. And that adds another ten million dollars to the agricultural industry. But swamps we got a swamp park down in Shalot. I mean who thought that you could turn a swamp into a money making venture? And the guy's taking on alligators intentionally. And getting paid to like keep alligators, and then you zip line. Well, you know, zip line over them. That would be he'd have a hard time getting insurance. But right beside him, he's making money off of his swamp. Whoever would have thought? That's pretty neat. But rivers. You might get some brackish water someday. A little bit of tidal influence. So we're not going to grow oysters, but there's got to be something else that can be done right there in the river. I, I believe there's got to be something. Moderate climate, nearby urban centers, the jet port manager down in Southport says money doesn't fly, drive in, it flies in. And he's got a good point. He says folks are coming here looking for our California climate on the East Coast. So, great climate here, nice people, and good location. So money flies in, he says. Nearby urban centers, some of the folks on my staff and clients that come that talk about the benefits of having Bloomington and Myrtle Beach nearby, with the cultural arts that are there. You have your cultural arts center here as well. Abundant transportation options, road, rail, and our planes, because I wanted to keep with the alliteration. Those that are planes instead of air. All right, tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Dancers with me. Okay. So prevalent green industry, that's agriculture too. And that sets up a little bit of what I was thinking for some of the resources that we have available. Folks that are working golf courses, people that are in the landscaping industry have some of that horticultural background, that biological background that wouldn't take a whole lot more training to get them to whatever level is necessary to do some new operation here, whatever that may be. These are challenging landscapes because of our climate, but, and the golf course could be challenging too. There's a guy chipping across the street in Hokan when I was driving 
down the, the road. So the courses can be challenging as well as our climate. The, a lot of these folks that work there internally are going to have pesticide licenses. They're going to have some level of training in agrochemicals and sometimes chemistry as well. So those might be resources to utilize for other job training things that, that might come in as a new industry. I'm sure that somebody has given you the rundown from the county data book and the planning department with the changes that they're expecting in our demographics and population growth in the next 10 and 15 years. And that's a lot of more people. So anytime I'm, I feel surprised by new apartment complexes or multifamily homes going up, I remember that, hey, we got 50% more people coming in the next dozen years. <clears throat> Our population growth has been incredible. And part of that's due to infrastructure. So if you build it, they're going to come. This is a, a great place to live and work and grow things. So they're coming. I was on the Brunswick County Vision Team to a committee to get the Brunswick 2020 Vision going. That was last year to get a strategic plan going for the county. And some of the, the survey data that came through was a lot of the people that took the survey for what are you doing here? What do, what do you want to see around here? We mapped them. And they were coming from New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia. That such an area of our country and just relocating right down here. And you can take your own little personal survey at the Walmart and at the grocery store and see a lot of the same thing. I don't know how many of you came from places like that, but there was a, wasn't a whole lot of distribution across the country. There were a few people from most states and then this giant cluster of people from right there in the New York, New Jersey area. So perhaps that's more marketing that's going on up there for some of our developments. Perhaps that's any number of other things. But the, the agricultural desires of folks in that region of the country, from what I hear from my colleagues, is transparency and traceability in foods. The whole the clean food, whatever that means to you, or to the company that's selling you clean food. I wash my produce, generally. And so I have clean food, too. But being in the Briars commercial from 20 years ago, maybe, with the kid reeling the stuff on the label, is to have understanding what's in your food and where it comes from, that's going to be an issue. So the more localized we can bring our food from and into the restaurants or into our grocery stores, then that's going to be a touch point for a lot of people that are currently here and that are coming this way. Policy things, since this is a town council function and unit, we got some, some different things going on. And one of those is backyard chickens. Some counties, and there were, excuse me, some municipalities regulate the use in, of backyard chickens. So when people come to me, oh no, my HOA or my town or my city won't allow chickens. I didn't look up your regulations, so I don't, I don't know if you allow them or not. I, tell, I encourage them to just leash the animals and name them. And so <laughs> maybe that'll get you by until you can find another way to, to do things. But the Department of Agriculture came out with some rules recently that you can have your own chicken protein production operation with up to 20,000 birds per year that are slaughtered on your farm without much regulation at all. 20,000 birds on one spot without having a, a dedicated slaughterhouse or taking your birds to a, a big slaughter facility. You can do all that, 20,000 birds in a calendar year on your farm and then we have places that you can't have chickens at all. So that's a, an interesting thing to me, where we could have all this production and all this local food coming into the, the market, but then you pass this invisible boundary of a municipality 
and then no chickens at all. There's some sort of part of that local foods movement is getting back into local food production, so more vegetable gardens, more raised beds, more yeah, chicken and getting eggs off of your own little flock. So those are things that municipalities are gonna have to deal with. Them. Present use value in the county, those 50,000 acres near abouts of farmland are eligible for present use ta value taxation deferment. So it's not an exemption of taxes, but it is a, a much reduced fee for folks that are actively in agriculture with some land restrictions, size of operations, the thresholds that need to be met. Then you have a, a much reduced tax bill. Most of those folks are in the voluntary ag district, but that's a, that's a way to encourage and support agriculture. We have an agricultural development plan that's coming out later this year. I'll be sure to get you a, a copy to share with your colleagues here. And it talks about things that, that are already in place to support farmers. Agencies and departments that have resources or information to assist farmers that are starting up, farmers that are changing, farmers that are doing something new, and farmers that are continuing to do their standard practices. Can you speak to that just a little bit more? Because that might tie in an opportunity for economic development for the town of Leland. I know when you said that, it triggered a thought that I had seen in the uh, Kippinger letter that uh, the future of farming could rely heavily on robots, okay. uh, the robotic industry. Do you see that happening in North Carolina and how that could be an opportunity here? Sure. And the, the use of those advanced technologies is all about labor savings. Labor is one of the biggest expenses in agriculture, so the, the more mechanization you can do, and the, the fewer breaks people have to take, it's the fewer people you have to hire to make that happen. And it's tough. It's not easy to find good labor, especially in agricultural industry. So, yes, and I've seen robots doing farm work. I've seen them doing composting operations, I've seen sheets of, of offerings from Case International and demonstrations from bigger companies, John Deere with satellite technology to, to drive these cabless tractors. It's kind of funny. No, no tractor on there, no cab on there. There's no place to sit. Just tractors driving around. In Brunswick County, those, those um, economies of scale work really well with farms over 500 acres, over 1,000 acres. We don't have a whole lot of super large farms that are contiguous. I've been to some in North Carolina, but there's not a whole lot right here. So our robotics are gonna be more along the lines of weed management, along the lines of maybe picking higher value crops. Strawberries are almost ripe now, so Holden Brothers has some right now. That's where our technology is probably going to go into the higher value crops, more specialized agriculture, rather than the commodity production situations. Are there any pockets in North Carolina where these robots are being made or serviced? That's another point I wanted to chat about, resources for agriculture. So in agriculture, you need your inputs, so fertilizers, seeds, different things like that. Backyard feeds, I drove by there to come through recently, that's changed hands, that, that company is different now. It includes more hunting, pet supplies, things like that. So there are resources for home scale and really small scale agriculture, but any farm of any, any size is gonna have to go to ash or probably white bull to get a lot of their inputs and it's even further to get maintenance on those tractors. A lot of folks go to Clinton, for a, to the, the dealership there to get their tractors worked on. And it's tough to bring somebody down here to do those things on account of all the water that's around us. So to, to set up a new operation like that, you got to, you're looking for a, a base of, of customers and we 
we don't have a 360 degree swap of customers down here. So we're gonna have to go elsewhere for a lot of our inputs. But that's one great thing about being here. We got all that transportation with the, the rail and the port right here. So if you can value add to the commodities that you can get locally or bring here, then it gets shipped off internationally real quick so that you have that that benefit to be in here. Did we talk about everything you wanted to, you want to talk about robots, oh, farming robots? Pick your brain for the future of, of this industry and how that could tie into our innovation park. We don't have a whole lot of dirt here in the, in the, the town of Leland, but the county certainly has a lot of dirt. And trying to figure out how uh, that, that opportunity could, the future of farming could tie into what we're trying to do here. Neat. Wouldn't it be neat if the, the land of was grass would produce something other than just something green to look at and maybe picnic on? So I'd love to see our churches and our schools grow the foods that should be going into our schools and going into the food pantries and through the food pantries that, that those establishments take care of. Green roofs on government buildings to, to be a, a role model for the things that can happen, especially on commercial buildings and structures, and solar panels, whatever else. So that'd be neat if we could do more of that production. So dreamers tend to, to talk about vertical farming and farming inside of a shipping container and I can grow all this food inside of this thing. Well, we have an abundance of sunlight and heat, so there's no need to, to put stuff inside a greenhouse unless you really, really want to. It can grow outside just fine. It can grow in the ground just fine. We don't have to do that stuff unless there's a specialized need for it, which I'll also support people if they feel that way. That's fine. I cannot stand raised bed gardener, but if it gets you to grow some vegetables, then I am all for it. You're putting all that input into the, this raised bed above the ground, the, the dirt that we already have. It's not bad, you just might need to work on it a little bit. So you're putting all these inputs on top and growing in there and doing all this stuff that you could have taken that same amount of resources and soon have really improved what you already had. But hey, it got you gardening and that's the most important thing. So if there's a tie-in for that with economic development, it would be don't reinvent the wheel. You got some great stuff right here. Let's just maximize what we have. But hey, that's your decision and not mine. And I got several slides left. You <coughs> told me I was shooting for 15. <coughs> 30. Okay, transportation. Oh, we already talked about that. The port being right there. So I've traveled to other parts of the country and even parts of our state. There's a guy with an old tobacco warehouse in Wilson. Oh, Mount Olive, that's where it was. And he's taking hay from all over the place around North Carolina, compressing it into super tight bales and shipping it to Egypt for their racing horses and camels because they can't grow a whole lot of hay at the quality levels that this person's grabbing from in, in nearby Eastern North Carolina. So compressing what we already have and shipping it off to people that want it. There's an option. We got lots of, of neat stuff that folks are doing. It. Yep, somebody had a, a harebrained idea and it worked. But labeling, I want to mention that, the non GMO, we get all that organic and all this different stuff. It doesn't have to be <coughs> any one or all of these things. People say chemical free, but water is technically a chemical, so we can't really chemical free things. And there are organic pesticides. These things aren't all the same. And I got an orange juice bottle the other day that had non-GMO on it. If any industry needs GMOs, it's the citrus industry because of some pests and diseases that are coming at that. Let's let science take care of that problem instead of having zero oranges. But that's Mark Blevins talking. That's not your cooperative extension director talking, so please don't tell my boss. <laughs> Resources as I see them, we're big on grains here, so if there's something that you could do with corn, that might involve some water and heat and time 
And then distillation, right, that's a really good option because we could have some ultra local distilled grains that we can make within, oh sheesh, five miles of the town limits. We could get enough for a, a really sizable operation of a distillery. Sweet potatoes, they're turning that stuff into vodka too. So you got lots of opportunities there. But North Carolina is the number one sweet potato grower in the entire country. About half of all of the United States sweet potatoes come from right here in our state. So one out of every two bites of sweet potatoes that you get anywhere, you can trace it back to North Carolina. Yeah, it's probably from the same sweet potato. You can't like grow half a potato somewhere else, but you can. Uh, if not, I'm available at after this. <laughs> if there's something else you can do with sweet potatoes, I, mean, I read an article the other day about protein gummies made with sweet potatoes. So from the, the excess stuff, the, not excess, but the, the coals or the things that are skipped by the number one selections as, people, as the harvesters are going through there. So the small ones and the giant ones get left behind. And you can make a lot of neat stuff out of those. They're not market grade things, but those sure turn into dog treats, sweet potato flowers, these protein gummies that somebody's selling to the marathoners, and all kinds of neat stuff. So having those, somebody in a think tank somewhere Think up this stuff and then make it happen right here in Leland. Maybe you'll have a tax incentive for anybody doing stuff with local commodities. I don't know, or North Carolina crops or I don't know how you do that. That's your that's your job. Mine is to help the person that you bring down here to make happen. Oh, back to the grains we talked about distilling, but also brewing that stuff, fermenting in any situation where there's beer. Why don't you have a microbrewery yet? What is going on? I mean, Holden Beaches has one of those. And so does, I mean, don't let Bolivia get a microbrewery before you do, okay? <laughs> don't let that happen. <laughs> Southport's got one, all this stuff. And we have a young grower. He's in his 20s, and he's starting to grow barley. His father was the, or, you know, the Small Grains Association president for the whole United States a couple of decades ago. And now his son's taking that on with barley and oats and different things. <laughs> to hopefully malt some of them in small batches. So we've got some stuff going on. Water. Mariculture might not happen up this far in the river, but maybe there's some other clams or shellfish that can be grown right here in your waters, just off of the banks of Leland. Leland clams, known worldwide. I mean, that'd be kind of fun. It's a lot of And it's not ugly. I mean, Brunswick County got locked down on the mariculture industry, most of our waters and, and estuary areas are closed to commercial shellfish production. Harvesting is fine, but not the commercial mariculture stuff. Because somebody thought it was going to be, excuse me, that's me editorializing again. My hypothesis is that somebody thought it was ugly and going to be some farmer in overalls coming up right up on their shore in their multi million dollar house and picking shellfish, but it's really not that bad at all. A couple of poles, a couple of lines, and you still get your lovely view. And we get what's currently a million dollar industry in the state to be more like the Virginia industry, which is, geez, it's like 80 million, 100 million dollars just of, of oysters. So yeah, there's a lot of growth potential there if we don't restrict it, or if we don't restrict it in super smart ways that allow for that. Smoked fish, Acme smoked fish, just uh, north of Wilmington on 421, brings in Chilean salmon to cold smoke and to hot smoke right there. It's a pretty neat operation. I mean, we can't grow salmon here, <laughs> but there's lots of other opportunities. If we can get some more commercial fishing resources going, it can be value added right nearby. And lagoons, hog lagoons, I'm not saying to grow fish in there, but there are neat industrial applications of those resources. If we don't treat all sort of byproducts as waste, you can tent those lagoons, and capture the, the natural off gases, and use those for energy production. Specialty crops, barley, vegetables. You have one of the biggest tomato growers in the state right outside your limits, just well, technically a little bit north. Nevada area, so, and there's 
vegetable production around. That makes a lot of sense to me with so many tourists coming through. And if part of your goal of economic development is to get beds filled in the hotels, then we ought to be meeting their needs as well. There's a whole bunch of foodies coming through, so let's, let's pique their interest with a lot of neat vegetables that we can grow right here. Edamame is edible, soy, uh, edible soybean. And one of our local growers put out a, little, a tiny little plot of edamame, not much larger than, than our tables here. So he sold every lick of those edamame pods. He was going out there getting every single one he could because they were flying off the shelf. <laughs> Next year, he quadrupled his production, put it in a quarter acre. Or, yeah, this is not even close to that. So that would be like the, the footprint of maybe several of these rooms. And he barely sold half of the footing <laughs> to the year prior. So it's tough for these folks to try to, to figure out what the trends are. Maybe it just was on the Food Network a couple of times, and people loved it that year, and then the next year, it wasn't. Who knows? It's tough on them. So anything you can do to support our agricultural industry because they're facing a whole lot of risk will be well. All right, so opportunities I see involve agricultural tourism. They involve value-added processes, heritage products, and industrial applications. You ready? Okay, fine, even if you're not. So farm to table and then back to table to farm. Farm to table stuff is making that transparency and that traceability. Hey, I just had a great meal down the street and the food came right for the, the beef came from so-and-so's farm and the edamame came from this dude and the walnuts and the ice cream came from such and such. People love telling that story. The more stories we can tell, on your economic development websites and with the your clients' websites, the better off we'll be. Table to farm, get them to go back to the farm as well. So they have that experience nearby, um, having that as part of your economic development portfolio. These are the, the growers in our area. They're producing food for us so that our factory workers can keep on eating and, and whatnot. Field the glass for distilleries and breweries making sure there's a connection there, a story to be told. The more stories these, these hipsters hear, the more they're eating it up. So in, in my experience, and I'm not trying to generalize on a generation, but that's a, that's a thing with those bearded, suspender-wearing friends of mine. Okay, <laughs> vegetables, they're healthy. I mean, we're, we're promoting health with connected neighborhoods and si more sidewalks, more bike trails. Let's get people not just moving, but also eating properly. Seafood, we can catch a whole bunch of stuff here locally, but 99, 98% of the seafood that is consumed in North Carolina comes from elsewhere. So whether that's nationally or internationally. So even on the coast, even if it's a restaurant that has water right outside of it, that restaurant is probably serving most, if not all, of their seafood frozen from somewhere else. So let's get more local foods going into our restaurants, into the individuals here, and pre-orders. Working on a project in Holden Beach, and now it's in Carolina Beach, to do vacation-supported agriculture, or you may have heard of community-supported agriculture, as you buy a subscription of vegetables <coughs> early in the season, the farmer uses those inputs, to put that stuff in the ground, and then you get either a bumper crop or a meager crop, depending on what happened during the year. It's a, it's an investment. It's your venture capitalizing with that, that individual grower. Growing all these veggies requires irrigation. Is there a, is there an issue from your perspective on Gen X? Not yet. So, thank you for providing bottled water today. It's delicious. <laughs> I drink tap water, and so that's gonna, that'll maybe explain any of the problems that, that people think I have. <laughs> so I'll just blame it on the water. Gen X is, plants are remarkable filters of a lot of chemicals, and I have not seen any research specific to Gen X, but there's a, a lot of plants that can uptake what you don't want, then you harvest that sunflower, for instance, can take up heavy metals, 
out of any brown fields you might have nearby, and then you harvest that biomass, and then either dispose of it or burn it in a, a generate a energy generation facility, something like that. But even in our vegetables, plants are a remarkable filters. It's the peduncle, the little tiny part of a plant that some botanist named that goes between the stem and the fruit is a, a remarkable filter to keep a lot of problem compounds out of that tomato or out of that blackberry. So, and you're better off eating vegetables than staying afraid of things and not eating vegetables. So I say not a problem yet. The wells that work that have found Gen X were pretty localized to the production facility. And our river is going to have some of that, but very little river water is used for irrigation on our cropland. Well, we deal to you as the wells. expert, but in Blaine and Pender County, they've been dumping out the honey. So uh, I don't, anyway, I don't mean to get off oh, sure. track here, but uh, when you're talking about growing vegetables, it just irrigation becomes a, a, a demand, a need. Absolutely. So, and wax is an incredible, is the liver for the honeybee as a superorganism. The wax grabs so many compounds, so many pesticides that are in the pollen, in the environment that the bees are going around. So yes, that would certainly be found in wax in higher concentrations. Honey's good for you. There's so many medicinal properties to it and health values. So I'm going to keep eating honey regardless. Unless Yep, personally, can't say that as the extension director, but I'm gonna keep eating it. The, because of how that cycle works, how that system works. You're gonna have a lot of, of problems in general with Gen X, with pesticides, with just chemicals in the, the all around. Oh man, it's already full. I need to stop. Sorry about that. You can you can yeah, go okay. through. Go yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Last one. Second one. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay. Mark, what was the word that botanist came up with? Peduncle. It's the peduncle. -E P-E-duncle. P-E-duncle, thank you. P-U-N-C-L-E. That's so a trivia question. The, oh yeah, that's the connective structure between fruits and stems. Value added processes, take what we got and turn it into something really amazing, including sweet potato fries, dog treats, vodka, anything else you can think of to use the sweet potatoes in your body. Wood pellets, I mean, people are putting that in their grills these days, making furnaces that'll take the take corn and wood, wood pellets, compressed hay, I mentioned that one. You had somebody talk to you about head prosthetics before. Heritage products, you've got a rice festival coming up. That's pretty neat, glad to help with that. Salts, we have salt water. There's small microprocessors for salt in the area. That'd be pretty neat. Indigo as a dye, as a heritage product. Indigo Farmers down in Calabash knows a little bit about that. Maple stores, I don't even know if that'll ever come up again, but if somebody wanted to make their own little local dinghy and they could get some local pine and local pitch and turpentine and make that sucker, that'd be pretty neat. Industrial applications had an industrial hemp interest meeting on Friday. A lot of folks interested in that for CBD oil production. There's also hemp fiber that can be done. Solar farms, the county doesn't really like them, or at least some of the county commissioners don't really like them right now, but uh, that's, that's one other way to get some, some economic generation on your farm. And if you raise them up a little bit, you can have animals graze underneath. That'd be pretty neat. Hydrolysis for our hog lagoon, off gases, biomass for power generation, whether it's, it's tree biomass, whether it's grass biomass that's used for, for power generation, that'd be pretty neat. Okay, my last little thing is a pitch from a volunteer that came with me to Small Farms Day yesterday. He said, what if our economic development folks would reach out to the retirees that are coming in, especially the recent retirees that still have a whole bunch of connections in their own industries to try to to get connected to folks that are making decisions on relocations or startups 
and then get those people to, to have some goodwill and bring them in to you so that you can make the pitch to their companies. It'd be really neat if there was that recent retiree network that could just invade the whole United States and even internationally to, to grab people and bring them right here to Leland. I thought that'd be pretty, pretty remarkable. And with the right person at the helm, might not be too difficult. So good luck with all the work that you do. I am here for any farmer, any agricultural operator that you can snag and bring to the area or send to me. Be glad to help them with their operation to be more successful and more economically sustainable. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Are there any hemp farmers in the county right now? Yes, there are. There's of any scale. There's one current hemp farmer that's. You don't have to be a really large scale for the CBD production. I mean, a big operation right now in North Carolina is 15 acres. 20 is is way above average. The so starting small, there's a lot of merit in that. Our current grower had a total loss last year on account of the hurricane, but it's starting up again this spring. Oh, that's why I said on the last one, hope springs eternal. There's always, the farmer's always gonna try again. So even if they are disheartened and downtrodden, they're gonna keep on going every year. And that's, you don't always have that in every industry. So. So yes, and we're getting more and more licensed folks every year. Been about one or two over the last couple of years every year. Here's, this is my cell phone number, so you can send people my way. You can call me, just not on the weekends. I mean, it's, you can probably wait. Weekends are fine. Mr. Chairman, if I may have a question. Please. Uh, out of all those opportunities, what do you see best suited in your opinion, for Leland? Or what is Leland best suited for those opportunities? I say anything that'll get to the port, that needs to get to the port. It'd be, some of these things don't take up a large footprint. The hay compression people, that was just a, an old tobacco warehouse. Uh, 30,000 square feet. Hay to the warehouse, compresses it on the, on the truck. Yeah, he stores the thing in the, the back three quarters of the warehouse, and then all year long, he's just pushing them into cubes, shipping it out. When it's empty, it's next harvest season. Fills it up again, starts packing it. Pretty neat. So these things don't take a whole lot of, of space all the time. The vodka processor for sweet potatoes, and they're making baby food and sweet potato puree and the pumpkin spice sort of chunks that you get in bagels and whatever else they're doing all that and it's not a large facility so the agriculture takes a whole lot of land but to add the value to it those processes don't take a whole lot of space so anything that you can get that'll that you can just house here that people are drawing in agricultural products that need to go internationally i think is a it's a great spot it's a great place to live there's it's a rural county surrounded by urban centers so you can get some of those newer, younger folks in agriculture to settle here with all their connections out in rural North Carolina and then bring it right here to Leland and get it out around the world. That's where I see the biggest opportunity and that's, where, that's why I'm focusing on sweet potatoes and those grains. The, the secondary one would be the distilling and brewery stuff. The regulations have come down significantly, those barriers have come down significantly in the last year or two. So that's why we're seeing this explosion of microbreweries and distilleries. Pretty neat, you could have your own little trail through the Cape Fear region. And that's the, oh, anybody that comes, that you're, one last thing that I'll say is, folks that come to visit you, you might just give them a, a little Venus flytrap as a, a hey, thanks you came, glad you came. Uh, don't get trapped at other places. Come put roots down with us or something cheesy. I don't know, Ben Mar will come up with something like that. Because <laughs> the, uh, there's a, a grower, a greenhouse grower who's got three little greenhouses and he pumps out Venus flytraps all day long until people steal his stuff by cover of night. 
and then he has to start over. But three little greenhouses, and he's sending those fly traps all over the nation, all over the country, Alaska and elsewhere. So little school kids can have this little tiny terrarium of a Venus fly trap. And that's happening right here. And it doesn't take a lot of space. So you can do it in a, a municipality like this or in your, your park that you're coming up with. So good luck. If there's anything else I can I can do, if you need to bounce it off an idea about economics with agriculture and the environment, happy to do that. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions from our committee members, members of the committee that uh, have any questions? Gary? So, Mark, thank you so much. Uh, uh, have you defended your dissertation? Oh, yet? I did. Thank you for uh, letting me delay my presentation on account of that. Yes, I passed with conditions on the, the day after I was scheduled for this. And so I've been frantically editing and changing and making all these arrangements for my committee members. And I got my fourth of four approvals today, early. So I'm going to celebrate this evening. So you're now a I'll doctor. see you guys a little later. Congratulations, Dr. Yes. Thank Thanks again. I'm sure we'll uh, probably be in touch with you, though, because uh, when we read all the uh, minutes that Nancy does for us, uh, all the good information you presented has uh, been extremely helpful in exactly what we needed and what we're trying to do in this committee. Thanks. Thanks again. All right, moving uh, forward. Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, Mr. Stevenson left, and therefore we no longer have a quorum. I don't know so, if he's uh, coming back. Does, coming does that back. mean we can't meet? I mean, we, uh, we can't vote. We can um, we can adjourn the meeting and then talk, just talk informally if you'd like to do that. But you can't perform any business or we don't have a quorum. We can't have presentations without we can't move forward unless we adjourn and then just stay here and, and work. talk informally, yes. Okay. If you'd like to do that, you can Or adjourn. we can reschedule my, I don't mind rescheduling my presentation when there's more committee members. I think that might be. Yeah. Okay. Not that you three aren't important, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was just going to say the three of us are the most important ones anyway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have so, the chair and the vice chair. So my well, suggestion yeah. would be to postpone my presentation on opportunity zones until our next regular meeting. Okay, and what about working with John? John is, he John doesn't is have working anything to present behind the scenes. Why don't you, uh, why don't you give them a rundown of what your plan is at this point, what you're doing and, and what what the timing is of so I have already well, begun. We the well, I, I, I have begun the process of putting together the final report and intend to add to it uh, as we learn things like we just did. But uh, I've reserved three days uh, in the beginning of April where I have nothing else on my calendar and those three days will be devoted to producing the product. And once I get the product, Gary will perform edits and beautify it put watermarks in the background and flowery phrases were appropriate. So, and then as we learn things like when the North Carolina ports guy finally shows up, I can insert those very quickly. So the work will essentially be done in another two weeks. That's great, John. Thanks yep. for your continued good efforts. And uh, of course you have the uh, NCAA basketball schedule. You schedule our next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> when it's too quiet. Okay, then I sense that um, uh, we are due uh, an adjournment until our next meeting. What is that time frame? What's our next meeting? April 11th. I'm sorry, dear. April 11th. April 11th. 6 p.m. April 11th. We've had, this is the last. Um, Three o'clock meeting. Now we will go back to monthly. Right. Um, six o'clock meeting. Okay. I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. I move. We have a motion and a second. In discussion, all in favor say aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Great presentation. Thank you so much.